in this required pre-lecture video, we'll be talking about the idea's center of mass, um, which is also sometimes called the center of gravity. This comes from section 8.5 of your text. All right, so, so far in this course, we've talked about um, the motion of objects and have sort of assumed that they're basically point particles located in one space. Um, however, we know that a lot of things actually have a dimension associated with them, or there might be a system of particles. It turns out that everything we've learned applies to what's called the center of mass of the particle. So that, for example, the trajectory, the parabolic trajectory that something will follow um, will actually be the trajectory of their center of mass. So even as, say, a basketball player leaps through the air um, and you know changes his body position, the actual center of mass of that um, person will follow a nice parabolic trajectory. Okay, so we can say that either a system of particles um, or an object or a person um, with some dimension will move along a path described by um, the location of its center of mass. So one example when I talk about a system of particles um, is to imagine an airplane. So I'm going to attempt to draw an airplane here. That wasn't so bad. Um, so let's say that this is some sort of toy airplane and it's flying in a straight line and then at some point it explodes. Right? I made it a toy just so it's less morbid, but if it was, say for example, a space shuttle explosion, then this would apply to the debris of that as well. And it's flying above, say, level ground. When you have the explosion, then it basically at that point its engine shut off. It would be in free fall. There would be a parabolic trajectory of the center of mass of all of that debris. So this would then be the parabolic trajectory of the center of mass. So that all of the debris would then be scattered um, appropriately around that terminal point for this parabolic trajectory. So that's an example of how this idea can apply to a system of particles. Um, but like I said, um, objects with some dimension to them it would also apply in that case. So we can actually calculate the location of the center of mass. And so we can say mathematically, we can determine the location of the center of mass by writing down the coordinates for where it would be located. So let's say, for example, we have some mass over here in this quadrant, and then a second, say, smaller mass over here in this other quadrant. And so we'll call this one M1 and this one M2. Um, and now the center of mass, first of all, you would know we would expect to lie it along the line that sort of joins them if there's just these two particles. And you'd expect it to be a little bit closer to the heavier one. So you'd have here then some location, say, for your center of mass. So we can then write down the coordinates for each particle. So this one here would be um, the x-coordinate, x2, and this would be y2, right? That's just our position vectors. This would be x1, and this would be y1. And we start relative to the origin, 0, 0. And our end goal is to find the x-position of the center of mass, which we'll call x sub cm, and the y-position of the center of mass. And so we can actually write down the formula for that where the x position of the center of mass is actually defined to be m1 times x1, so this mass times its position vector, um, plus m2 times x2 divided by the total mass m1 plus m2. And the y position of the center of mass is the same thing, but with the y. So m1, y1 plus m2, y2. And again, these are position vectors, so you have to include sine, um, divided by the total mass m1 plus m2. 
Now, in general, you don't really always just have two objects. You might have more than that, or it might be a continuous object, in which case you can think of it as the sum of infinitely small masses dm. So in general, we can say that the total mass is equal to capital M, which is equal to the sum over i of all m sub i's, right? m1 plus m2 plus m3 plus m4, etc. And so then we can say that the position of the center of mass in general is going to be, again, be a ve vector. It's going to be a r vector, which is the sum of x i hat plus y j hat, which is going to be equal to 1 divided by the total mass times the sum over i of m sub i r sub i. So m sub i r sub i, and that's the vectors and this would again be if you have a collection of particles. So this applies here for a collection of particles. This one is just solved algebraically, and so we will have examples where you use this equation and apply it. Um, if time permits, we'll work on learning how to solve it for a continuous object. But for now, we can understand just based on the ideas of calculus, that if you have a sum here, and that sum then um, becomes continuous, then you can basically make that sum over a continuous object, and it becomes an integral. So for an object, you can say that the position of the center of mass would be equal to 1 divided by the total mass, same. And then this integral becomes, a, I mean, sorry, this sum becomes an integral over the position vector and the small little mass increments dm. And so for this, I'll say that we'll learn to do that integral um, if time permits. But conceptually, we can still understand that this idea of center of mass easily translates to um, solid objects. Okay, so in this second part, of this required pre-lecture video, we're going to introduce some of the terminology that we'll use in rotational motion. Um, this is selected topics from sections 9.1 through 9.3 of your textbook. So, so far, everything has been translational motion. So everything we've talked about so far in this course is what we call translational motion. And what we mean by that is translational motion is where the center of mass of the object moves in space. So translational motion is motion of the center of mass. But we can also have an object that isn't moving its center of mass through space, but is simply rotating and around an axis through its center of mass. And in that case, then, we would have rotational motion and we have to now learn how to apply our ideas to that. So for rotational motion, we can imagine, say we have a disk that's rotating, and there'd be some center to it, and say that there's um, you know, some point on this disk that we'll just put here. And as this point as this disk spins, right, it's going to travel some arc length here. So this distance s is the distance that the point travels as the disk spins through an angle theta. So let's mark theta here. And as the disk spun through an angle theta, this point moved a distance s. So the distance that is traveled as this one point spins um, through some angle theta, where theta now, remember, is going to be in radians, then this distance s is actually going to be equal to r, which is the distance from the center to the point times theta. 
So hopefully that's something that you've seen before. It's a refresher of the basic geometry of the circle. It makes sense, right, that if you go through 2 pi, then the circumference of that circle is 2 pi r. Um, and so this then is just the small portion of that circumference, depending on what theta is, again, in radians. Okay, so we can then talk about, you know, this is the distance traveled, and so you can imagine that one point is basically undergoing translational motion. And so some things that we talk about make sense, but more commonly, you want to come up with something that's true for every point on the disk and not just specific to that one because one that's further out would have traveled a farther distance in that same amount of time. So now we can actually talk about what are going to be called your angular displacement, your angular speed. I'm going to write down all the terms and then I'll define them. So your angular displacement, your angular speed, and your angular acceleration. These are sometimes called rotational displacement, rotational speed, and rotational acceleration. Angular and rotational are sometimes used interchangeably. So angular displacement here would be how far it has gone in terms of its angle, right? So displacement before was delta x, now it's going to be delta theta. So the angular displacement is defined as some theta final minus some theta initial, and again, this is used in radians. The angular speed is not, you know, how what's its distance traveled divided by the time, but instead it's going to be the rate change of the angular displacement, right? Before we had that um, translational velocity was delta x over time. So it makes sense that we would have angular speed would be then um, d theta dt, how quickly that angle is changing. And that's going to be defined as omega, so not a w, but that's an omega, and that's going to be in radians per second. And you can then have an average omega, an average angular speed, which would be equal to your angular displacement divided by time. And then lastly, the angular acceleration is going to be given by alpha, and that's going to be, as you might expect, d omega dt. So the rate change of the angular speed, or the angular velocity specifically. Um, and the unit for this would then be radians per second squared, just like meters per second squared, but now we're talking about angular displacement. And the average angular acceleration would be equal to delta omega over delta t. Now, again, it's important to point out that these are going to be the same for all points on some rigid disk, right? So this is independent of where it is located. So these these terminologies and these ways of describing this rotation of the disk apply to the entire disk. The disk has, you know, some speed and acceleration um, and displacement in some given time. Now, on the other hand, when we start writing down the translational um, quantities for a specific point, we'll see that it will depend on this r value. So you have all of these ideas for displacement, speed, and acceleration, and we had our kinematics equations for translational motion. So we want to recall that for a constant acceleration, we had the kinematics equations for now what we call translational motion. So we had, you know, v final, for example, equals v initial plus the acceleration times time, you know, et cetera. 
but it turns out that you make these same assumptions and without going through the derivations of all you can have your kinematics equations for rotational motion so then you end up with rotational motion kinematics equations and again I won't list them all here but you would imagine that V final that would turn into your angular velocity um, if time permits we'll talk about the sign of the angular velocity the direction associated with that it involves something called the right hand rule but for now you can say well you have your translational velocity that would be your angul angular velocity omega so omega final equals omega initial plus instead of your translational acceleration your angular acceleration and then times time because time is just time regardless of what um, whether you're talking about translational or rotational motion so you have then this set of equations that you can then use for problem solving when appropriate okay so lastly we're going to discuss the relationship between translational and angular quantities um, so I've redrawn the picture here where we have a point that's some distance r from the center and then it, the disk spins some angle theta so we have already decided that the arc length there of s is going to be equal to r times theta again I'll emphasize it in radians and so we can then talk about the speed v is going to be equal to ds dt right the rate change of that position and so that's going to be equal to d dt of r theta so the r for some point is going to be constant so that's going to be equal to r times d theta dt and remember d theta dt is just omega so that's equal to r times omega so we can then go through this for each value and you can fairly easily derive the relationship between the actual translational quantities which we've you know learned before and then their rotational counterparts and so we end up with some key equations so the translational speed which I'll call V sub T and then put this notation to include the rotational speed is going to be equal to R times Omega the ten translational acceleration is going to be equal to r times alpha and then we even have this idea of our centripetal acceleration right remember that the centripetal acceleration was equal to the translational speed v, v squared over r and now i'm just putting the subscript t to keep them clear from each other and so that's now equal to r omega squared divided by r so this equals r omega squared and so these equations are very useful as we'll see and we'll come back to them here and there in problem solving because you have a direct translation between say a point on a rotating object and what's happening in terms of its center of mass its translational motion and what's happening in its angular motion All right that concludes our pre-lecture video. Um, if you have any questions, let me know.